Hurricane Milton has made its path through Florida, weakening from a Category 3 to a Category 1 as it barreled across the state. At least nine people are dead because of the storm, four of which died after a tornado outbreak. More than 3.3 million people are without power and 11 million people are at risk of flooding. Hurricane Milton dropped more than 18 inches of rain on St. Petersburg, with wind gusts up to 100 miles per hour ripping the roof off Tropicana Field and sending a massive crane crashing onto an office building. Tropical storm conditions and storm surge continue along portions of the southeast coast. Recovery efforts across the state have begun as roadways stay closed. More than 40 rescues have been done. We have on-the-ground updates with News Nation senior correspondent Brian Enton in Tampa and reporter Ryan Bass in St. Petersburg. Thanks, Drew. Uh, we are in North Tampa uh, in an area that is very, very flooded. And this is nowhere near Tampa Bay or the ocean. This is inland, but they receive just so much rain. Take a look. Um, this entire neighborhood is pretty much underwater. The uh, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office has been out here all day doing water rescues. Uh, it was really scary because there's a senior uh, home out here where they had to rescue 100 seniors. There were people coming out in wheelchairs in the middle of the flood, just an awful, awful situation. And they plan to be out here all day long, continuing uh, to do these rescues. This is really the, the hardest hit area that we've seen in the Tampa area. Uh, there's also places uh, with, with a lot of trees down, roads are blocked, power is out in, in most of the city from what we can tell. But in terms of flooding, uh, this is definitely the worst of it. I'll send it now to Ryan Bass, who continues our coverage from the West Coast. Thank you, Brian. And yeah, we felt some of those really strong, catastrophic Hurricane Milton wind gusts come through the St. Petersburg region, especially where we are here in downtown St. Pete. And the damage sustained at Tropicana Field here behind me tells the entire story. The roof ripped off of this iconic baseball field, home to the Tampa Bay Rays of Major League Baseball. And the wind gusts, we felt them. We saw as the worst of this storm was coming through our area and the eyewall was going over Siesta Key, how powerful those winds were. And we started to hear the roof get ripped to shreds. Let's check out some of the video that we shot uh, from a drone that shows you the view of just how devastating this impact was, uh, not just on the greater St. Pete area, but specifically here at Tropicana Field. You can see the roof. I mean, I'd say 80, 90% of it is just straight gone, ripped apart by Hurricane Milton's uh, hurricane force winds. And when you peek inside, just look at the playing surface. There's debris scattered everywhere. You can see, you know, kind of the white little patch in the center of your screen. That is the pitcher's mound to Tropicana Field. And that gives you a sense of just how, how damaged this playing surface was. There's debris scattered everywhere. There was water from the 18 inches of rain we sustained here in St. Petersburg scattered on the field as well. So, uh, so much damage uh, was taken on by, by this building at Tropicana Field. I do want to read you a statement we got from the Rays um, that said their priority is supporting the community and our staff. They did say that they're fortunate and grateful that no one was hurt by the damage to the ballpark last night. They said over the coming days and weeks, they expect to be able to assess the true condition of Tropicana Field. And they said in the meantime, they're working with local law enforcement to secure the building. Now, there was a lot of reports about Tropicana Field being a staging ground for, or a base camp, basically, for first responders or emergency personnel. Uh, there were 10,000 cots set up inside Tropicana Field for crews that were here to, to clean up debris prior to the storm that was left from Hurricane Helene and to potentially go in and respond after the storm. But because of how bad the winds were and how quickly this storm gained in strength, Governor Ron DeSantis, the state and the team here at Tropicana Field made the decision to move that base camp to Jacksonville. So that happened on Wednesday prior to Hurricane Milton making landfall. So there were no first responders. There were no emergency personnel inside the ballpark when this storm was coming through. So certainly I know it's scary for a lot of folks seeing that and wondering, you know, kind of what would be left of the building behind me. I think it tells the story of just how powerful these winds were, Drew, uh, in terms of what we felt here in the St. Petersburg area from Hurricane Milton's wrath. And thank you to News Nation's Brian Enton and Ryan Bass for that coverage. You know, this is primarily a story about disaster and recovery, but as we often see, politics gets dragged into it. Joining us to discuss that and much more, the Hill White House correspondent, Alex Gangitano. Alex, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the controversial Georgia Congresswoman, wrote on Twitter X that the government is controlling the weather. Trump and his allies have been spreading misinformation about Helene in North Carolina. Kamala Harris called into CNN to kind of refute some of these claims. She's been in a bit of a spat with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. It's kind of sad, frankly, to see it devolve into this. But is this just something to be expected one month away from a presidential election? 
That's right. We are just a month away. Obviously, uh, Governor DeSantis has had his spats with President Biden. Now it seems like he's in one with Harris, while him and Biden are actually working along pretty well in this hurricane relief. But it's all become politicized, considering she's the vice president. She wants to get involved. She wants to show a leadership role right now. But DeSantis is saying, I'm just working with President Biden. I'm working with FEMA. I don't need to talk to her. You know, she's not the president, uh, whereas she's trying to look presidential in this moment. So she's in this position that uh, she's, you know, trying to reach out. But at the same time, they're also dealing with this misinformation campaign. So her and um, Biden have been talking about this a lot, about how dangerous this misinformation is. And that's become politicized this whole situation as well. So there's a lot of moving parts here. But we've seen Biden now several times, and we will again later today, talk about this misinformation and really call out Marjorie Taylor Greene, former President Trump, for talking about um, things that they're calling lies when it comes the hurricane. Let's talk more about the presidential race. Former President Barack Obama is heading to Pennsylvania. He'll headline a rally tonight in Pittsburgh. Trump was in Pennsylvania for two rallies yesterday. Decision Desk HQ says there's an 85% chance the winner of Pennsylvania wins the presidency. What do you think Obama brings to the table in that state? Yeah, that's right. Pennsylvania is the most important swing state this cycle. We know that. And they're bringing out the big guns by sending President Obama there. He's him and actually, I should say, Michelle Obama as well, are the two most popular Democrats. They have been uh, for you know, decades, I guess, at this point. Um, and having him is really showing off the talent of the party. He's one of the best communicators. He can give some of the best speeches within the Democratic Party. So they're bringing him out, showing, though, how focused they are in Pennsylvania because we're also going to see the vice president head there on Monday. We saw former President Trump there on Wednesday. Uh, everybody's laser focused on it. It's also a state that shows um, historically if you win Pennsylvania, you are pretty likely to win Wisconsin and Michigan. So it comes with so many prizes of winning the state and you can tell how focused they are on it. Yeah. And Kamala Harris is continuing this media blitz that she's on. Tonight she has a town hall event uh, with Spanish language Univision TV. You have a story out now that's talking about this kind of delicate line that she's walking where she's trying to avoid being critical of the Biden administration, which obviously she's a part of, while also kind of framing herself as a change candidate that offers something new and a new path forward. Um, in the last few weeks of this campaign, do you expect Kamala Harris to uh, split with President Biden more? Yeah, I think as she continues to roll out more policies, they will be different from Biden. She wants to show that four years of her would look different than four years of Biden. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to see a split that's anything showing that she's disloyal to the president because she has been his most loyal ally for the last three and a half years, especially while he was facing the pressure campaign to step aside. She stood by him. Um, so I think we're going to see them, you know, continuing this strong relationship that they have. But at the same time, she's balancing this line of saying, I wouldn't do anything differently from Biden. He didn't do anything wrong in his presidency, but I can just do things in a step forward or however she puts it, um, that she wants to be this change candidate. And what's interesting about this cycle, though, is she's running against someone who has already been the president. She's the sitting vice president. So when it comes to the change candidate, it's kind of a, a unique situation that we're in. She kind of reflexively seems to want to defend his administration. Uh, that answer that she gave on The View where she couldn't think of anything that she would have done differently. Republicans are already capitalizing on that. So if I wonder, they're going to take that, the Harris campaign is going to take that and say, you know, we kind of have to have a better answer there. Exactly. Will they say, you know, you're, keep, you're going to keep getting this answer. What are you going to say? And she did say later on in The View that actually something I would do differently would be uh, having a Republican in my cabinet. That would have been a great answer when she was asked At the question. At the time, right. Uh, let's talk about this new poll from The Economist and YouGov. It has Harris up four, per, uh, four percentage point nationally. Of course, the battlegrounds are where it's all at. They're extremely tight. This race is essentially a toss-up, which it has been. This week, though, there's been a lot of fretting from Democrats. I don't know if you've been picking it up in your reporting, but we've seen it a lot on social media. What do you make of kind of this hand-wringing that we're hearing from Democrats? There's a lot of talk of these internal polls. What do you yeah. think about that? I think if Harris was 20 points ahead nationally, they would still be panicking. Democrats learned their lesson in 2016 when they were very excited about Hillary Clinton and they were very disappointed when former President Trump won. So I think they've learned their lesson until literally the election is called. They are going to keep 
their panic and keep worrying. Um, and they are, I mean, four points ahead nationally, like you mentioned, they are relatively tied in a lot of these battleground states, and that's really what matters. And, you know, Harris has gone on media tours, she's gone to battleground states uh, day after day, and she's still not breaking through. There's nothing that's pushing her ahead. Same with former President Trump. He's not breaking through in these battleground states e either. So I think both of them are in this frustrating standstill that they're trying to figure out what will put me over the edge on either side. For the Harris camp and Democrats, it's probably a healthy position to be in to have Democrats staying up all night thinking of what <laughs> they can do to, to you know get a few extra voters and being really worried about losing. So maybe there's right. some advantage to that. Um, I want to talk about Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson. And, you know, he's a close ally of President, former President Trump. And if Trump loses, Speaker Johnson would, could play a key role in the certification of those results. And there's some worry among Democrats that in that uh, scenario, Speaker Johnson wouldn't abide by the law and fulfill his role. Can you talk a little bit about what Democrats are saying and what's the Republican response? Yeah, because Speaker Johnson, regardless of what happens this election cycle, who wins the White House, also who wins the House, he will be Speaker of the House in, on January 6th when they certify the election results. And so in that case, if there is a scenario that Trump loses. I think Democrats are preparing for him to, and Trump has laid the groundwork for challenges to an election result, but it's also the question of will how will Speaker Johnson um, act on January 6th. He said that he will follow the laws, follow the Constitution. He's a very by the books and, and wants to continue to appear that way. But at the same time, you know, when he's pressed in interviews about who won the 2020 election, he doesn't outright say President Biden, or he hasn't in recent interviews. So I think Democrats are now just keeping a close eye on how he answers those kinds of questions and what they're gearing up for in the event that Harris wins and Trump loses. We're learning more about the tense relationship between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This is all described in this new book from Bob Woodward called War. Um, Biden often used, according to the book, expletives to refer to Bibi Netanyahu, when he, especially when he's talking about uh, his handling of the war in Gaza. He's called him a liar and a bad guy, this according, again, to the book. Um, is it fair to say that the relationship between Biden and Bibi and, and maybe even like Democrats and Bibi in general is at an all time low? I think it's definitely strained. And we knew before this book came out that the White House has described it as a frustrating relationship. Biden has been giving so much. He's been uh, really pro-Israel. And it's he's taken a toll politically here in the U.S. with pro-Palestinian Americans, especially when he was still running for president. He saw protest votes during the Democratic primary. But then when he will give a warning to Prime Minister Netanyahu of you know, don't retaliate, and then Netanyahu does. Uh, Biden has to deal with the consequences of looking like Netanyahu ignores him or thinks he's weak or however they're taking that. And so I think the frustrations have been growing for months now, and I think amongst Democrats, too, that have been pro-Israel because, you know, they put a lot on the line and uh, politically, and now, you know, Netanyahu doesn't heed the warnings of the president. So this is definitely an ongoing relationship that everyone's watching closely of how those two, uh, Biden and Netanyahu, get along. And, and Biden has had a long career of a close pro-Israel relationship. Um, and so if this could be what kind of breaks out with this ongoing war, uh, you know, break decades of that relationship. Let's talk about the Senate race in Arizona. The candidates had a debate last night. Um, one of the major topics of discussion was immigration and specifically DACA recipients. These are undocumented immigrants who were brought into the country as children. We have a clip. Let's, uh, let's take a listen. They're using these DACA recipients as political pawns. I find that to be disgusting, Ruben. Why are you using them as pawns? Mr. Why Mayor, wouldn't let, you make a me, deal with President Trump? It was a, actually in the room when I was negotiating this with uh, General Kelly, Chief of Staff of uh, then President Trump. We actually did agree uh, to give the border wall for Dreamers. And then he came back and said, well, now we want to actually take and bring down more legal migration, take out green cards and everything else like that. Yeah, so actually, after, that's actually not true. He, uh, I was actually in the room. And I'm sorry. Instead what, of the 650,000 DACA recipients, first, please, and then we'll, President Trump tripled it. So I promise you rebuttal. rebuttal. I promise you. The candidates also spar sparred on immigration, inflation, election conspiracies, abortion. 
What did you make of this debate? And, and more broadly, what do you make of this is an interesting Senate race and one that is a little bit has a little bit wider of a gap, at least in the polls, than the presidential race in that state? That's right. It does have a wider gap. And Arizona is such a critical swing state that we know Harris and Trump are both really focused on winning as well. Um, and the border is an issue that's so important to Arizona and so important nationally. But um, in this Senate race, I think it really will come down to um, how people think the handling of the influx of migrants during the Biden administration or um, handling of immigration policies during the Trump administration, um, how it all was handled and also how these uh, candidates would handle it going forward. Uh, we, Carrie Lake, in this, it was a pretty feisty debate. Things were pretty tense in this debate. She really wanted to align the congressman with, you know, the uh, the the Biden administration, Vice President Harris, and how they have dealt with immigration issues. Meanwhile, um, he was aligning her with the fact that the bipartisan border bill ended up failing because of pressure from former President Trump to kill the bill. And then he celebrated when the bill, you know, failed in the House. So um, they're trying to, you know, align each other to their the two candidates at the top of the ticket. And I do think a lot of it will come down to immigration and who you trust more to handle a border state. And how big is the Trump Gallego vote? Could right. could be crucial to determining that state and other swing states that have close Senate races as well. Um, that's all we have time for, but Alex Gangitano, White House correspondent, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. Back here at home, Western North Carolina still grappling with the devastation left behind from Hurricane Helene, and it could have a big impact on which great way this battleground state swings. Blake Berman has more. Storms wrecking havoc on politics, including in the Tar Heel State. I'm Blake Berman with News Nation. Hurricane Helene devastated homes, roads, and communities in parts of North Carolina two weeks ago. Here are the 13 counties most affected by the storm. All of them lost buildings and infrastructure required to conduct elections in this crucial swing state. Absentee ballots are already out, and early voting starts next week. Now, the state is trying to keep the election running smoothly, despite the damage. That includes easing restrictions on absentee voting, assistance teams to get absentee ballots to shelters, and allowing the affected counties to modify their voting sites and early voting hours. Most of the affected counties turned out for Donald Trump in the last election. Asheville, right in the middle there, is a Democratic stronghold. In the last election, the area voted for Trump 54 to 44 percent. I'm Blake Berman, and this is the News Nation Political Minute. The U.S. has moved over a 1,000 citizens out of Lebanon as Israel ramps up its air and ground assault on the country. Ten out of 12 U.S. chartered flights arrived in Turkey last week, carrying the American citizens and their immediate family members. The United States and other countries are now relying on commercial and state book flights to get citizens out. The U.S. government has secured more than 4,500 seats for citizens flying out of Lebanon in recent weeks, according to officials. Happening Thursday, Sean Diddy Combs is set to make his first appearance before the judge that is expected to preside over his trial. Judge Arun Subramanian was assigned to the case after another judge recused himself. The hearing today is expected to set deadlines for lawyers on each side to submit arguments that would establish boundaries for the trial. No word on when that trial might happen. Combs has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. Those include racketeering and sex trafficking and are based on allegations of abuse and coercion that date back to 2008. Right now, he is being held without bond. New numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics show inflation is slowing, hitting a rate of 2.4% last month, the lowest it has been since February of 2021. The consumer price index numbers represent slightly higher prices in September than what economists predicted. It comes less than a month before the November election and just weeks after the Fed slashed interest rates by half a percent. The September rate likely won't change the Fed's policy of slowly decreasing interest rates. While slowing inflation helps consumers, it means a smaller bump in benefits for Social Security recipients. The Social Security Administration announced Thursday that starting in January, recipients will receive a 2.5% cost of living adjustment. Compare that to a 3.2% adjustment earlier this year and an 8.7% increase in 2023. The January increase will result in about $50 more per month for nearly 73 million retirees, disabled people, and children. 
The announcement comes as Social Security faces a financial shortfall within the next decade. According to a report released in May of this year, the Social Security and Medicare Trust Fund will be unable to pay full benefits beginning in 2035. Tennis legend Rafael Nadal has announced he is retiring from the sport. Nadal is widely regarded as one of the best tennis players of all time. His career has spanned over 23 years, and he has amassed 22 Grand Slam titles. Nadal suffered from continuing injuries that have limited his time on the court in recent seasons. His final tournament will be at the Davis Cup in November. The Kennedy family confirming on social media Thursday that Ethel Kennedy, the widow of Robert F. Kennedy, has passed away. Kennedy suffered from a stroke earlier this month and has been hospitalized since. She leaves behind a legacy as both a devoted mother of 11 and a hardworking humanitarian. Take a look. Born in 1928, Ethel Kennedy was a humanitarian, widow of U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy, and sister-in-law of President John F. Kennedy. While a student at Manhattanville College, the former Ethel Skakel took a ski trip with a classmate, where she met her future husband. In 1950, they married, and later had 11 children. They were married 18 years, but their union tragically ended on June 6, 1968. Oh my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. When Robert Kennedy was assassinated at the age of 42 by Sirhan Sirhan. Robert Kennedy's family and friends founded an organization dedicated to realizing his dream. That year, Ethel Kennedy founded the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights. The nonprofit organization made in her husband's honor promotes human rights advocacy and recognizes leaders through its RFK Human Rights Award. It also supports investigative journalists and authors through the RFK Book and Journalism Awards. Kennedy continued her humanitarian work all throughout her life, notably awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama in 2014. Ethel Kennedy was 96. And that's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.